So we've been talking about the ideal gas um, equation or the ideal gas law, all right? And uh, you know we've settled that that is PV equals nRT. Okay. Now the key word though is this is an ideal gas uh, law. So what exactly does it mean? that an, a gas is ideal, okay? Um, well, there are a couple of uh, characteristics that, uh, what they are, are assumptions that we made in order to come up with this equation, all right? And those assumptions, um, if they're true, then it's an ideal gas. And uh, if they're false, then um, it's not an ideal gas, okay? So the assumptions um, are, uh, first of all, that the volume of the, uh, the particles of the gas, see, we're, we're assuming uh, for an ideal gas, we assume that there's actually zero volume to the particles. All right, so the particles of gas themselves are really just pinpoints. They're not, uh, they don't actually have any physical volume. Okay, that's our assumption. And, it, you know, it's an approximation. Um, and it simplifies the equation. Um, and it helps us to come up with this nice, simple equation. And it works for the most part um, because of the fact that gases are uh, the molecules or atoms of a gas are very few and far between. There's a lot of space in between them. And therefore, even though they don't have a zero volume to the particles, compared to the overall volume of, uh, you know, that the gas is occupying, the particles are, are a small percentage of that volume. Okay, very small percentage. And so it approximates to, um, to having a zero volume, okay, um, in, in many cases. Not always. In those cases that it doesn't, it doesn't obey the ideal gas law. All right. Another assumption uh, that we use in the, uh, in the ideal gas law is that um, there are no forces of attraction between those molecules or atoms of the gas. And again, um, this is uh, a good assumption, uh, no attraction between particles. Okay, this would be a good assumption as long because there's a lot of space between the particles of a gas, right? So they're so far apart, there's not uh, much possibility for attraction between them. Oh, once in a while they'll run into each other and, and bump and, and a small attraction, but that's just a, a minor component and it doesn't uh, make a significant um, difference. Okay, so for the most part, that's okay. But under certain conditions, that that would break down. Okay, and you can think of this if you if you pressed uh, if you pressed the gas and you kept pressing it and pressing it, um, you know, pretty soon, you know, you're starting out. Uh, you have the gases fairly spread out, and then uh, you uh, you compress this down some, all right, let's, uh, let's say we've compressed it down uh, like that. Now those same gases, the same particles of the gas are closer together, all right? The more you compress it, the, the tighter uh, they are, and the more attractions there will be between the particles. Anytime they get close enough together, there's going to be an attraction between them. So if you compress it, um, enough, uh, then there's going to be more attractions between the particles and it's going to deviate from 
the ideal gas law. All right. So at very high pressures, you're going to um, have problems with the ideal gas law. It's not the gas is not going to follow that equation. Okay, and um, also um, uh, if uh, if we have uh, particles of gas that uh, are uh, large in comparison to the uh, space between the particles, um, we have to take that into account with reference to the volume, okay? Because the, the volume of the particles them themselves will uh, tend to um, expand the gas a little bit. It won't be able to get as small or as uh, compact as the ideal gas law um, would predict with them being just point particles, okay? If they actually have space around them, right, they can't get quite as close together, okay? And so um, that uh, normally doesn't play much of, uh, it doesn't have much of an effect, but if our uh, vo volume of the particles gets to be significant in comparison to the overall volume of the gas that it's occupying, then we need to take that into account. Okay, so let's look at what that, uh, what that looks like for a non-ideal gas. Okay, so we don't have a, uh, a good, uh, you know, completely theoretical equation that we can use like we do with the ideal gas law. Um, you know, this was, is just completely theoretical, but it fits the data pretty well, except under circumstances that uh, go against these assumptions. Okay, the non-ideal gas, in order to correct for those, uh, those differences, we, we have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis, okay? And we modify the, um, the ideal gas law um, to, uh, to correct for that, okay? So first of all, let's look at this. If we look at the volume component, okay? If we solve this for volume, we have nRT divided by the pressure. Divide both sides by pressure. NRT over P is our volume, okay? So this would be the volume of an ideal gas. That's the one that uh, looks at the particles as though they're just pinpoints and don't actually possess any volume in themselves. But for a non-ideal gas, we can't ignore the, their actual size, okay? Because that's going to, uh, you know, prevent them from getting close, uh, as close to each other as they could for an ideal gas, okay? And so we determine experimentally a, uh, a correction factor, all right? We add uh, a correction factor to the ideal volume, uh, um, and uh, that correction factor will depend on the number of moles of the gas, right? Because it's just on how many particles you have. The more particles you have, the more space those particles will take up. And so you have this, uh, the number of moles of the gas times um, this uh, constant, okay? Um, but it's a constant for a given substance, okay? That means um, every substance will have its own constant B, all right? And that makes sense because one molecule of gas might uh, have this size, but another one, it might be really big, okay? And so that one really wouldn't be able to get as uh, the particles really wouldn't be able to get as close to each other, right? So this is a constant 
but it's for a given substance. Every substance has its own value for B, and that value is determined experimentally, and uh, that would be something that would be uh, given to you. They're tabulated in a table. You look up the value for the substance, and, uh, and you can find out what to put there for that correction factor on the volume. Okay, so um, that's uh, how we correct for the uh, volume of a non-ideal gas. We just add that little factor in there. Okay, now we do a similar thing for pressure. Okay, uh, remember that was the other one that at high pressures, now uh, the, the particles are... Um, uh, getting closer together and that means there's attractions that will be happening between them. So if we solve this for pressure we have a similar looking equation nRT over V. All right, This would be the pressure of an ideal gas. All right? And just like um, uh, in the case of the volume, we had to add a correction factor because our volume of a non-ideal gas is, is going to be uh, a little bit bigger um, because the particles can't get as close to each other as we would predict with just the ideal gas. Right? So with the pressure, um, this time uh, the, the pressure is affected um, you know, as, as the, the pressure increases, okay, um, now there are attractions between the particles, and what that has, the effect that that has is, is now there's some attractions toward the particles, okay, so not, not all of their force is, is pushing outside of the container, some of it is also attracted to other particles in the um, in the gas right and so we um, have a negative correction factor okay and this time um, we use another constant okay call it a um, and this just like the other one is for a given substance. Okay, so you look up the values of A and B, these are experimentally determined. You wouldn't know what they are um, except uh, from looking it up in a table or something like that. For a given substance, you look up those values and that, and that will tell you how to correct for the uh, pressure. But we're not done here, that's just the constant. Um, but it's going to depend not only on uh, the volume, you know, as I shrink the volume, my attractions will increase. So an opposite relationship there. Um, the attractions will increase in proportion or in uh, an inverse relationship to the volume, but also to the number of particles. If I have lots of particles, I'm going to have a greater um, effect. And so what we see is uh, it, it comes to N over V, um, and that is actually squared. All right? Um, this is, uh, these corrections are something that um, uh, Van der Waals, a uh, man by the name of Van der Waals, uh, came up with to correct for the pressure and the volume of the ideal gases. So you have this little correction factor to each of those. And then um, in the end, we have the Van der Waals equation for a non-ideal gas. And what that ends up being is you have the pressure, um, which is just going to be uh, corrected with this factor. So there's the pressure. And um, then 
we have the volume. So, so there's my pressure. It's, I, I'm just putting that in for the ideal gas equation. Pressure with its correction factor times the volume with its correction factor, which was just in B. Okay. And then um, this equals N R T. Okay. And there's just one thing that I actually did uh, incorrectly, and that is um, my pressure. If I bring this correction factor to the other side, um, I'm actually going to have a positive sign. All right, so that should be a positive. And here, likewise, if I bring that NB over there, it's going to be V minus um, NB. Okay, so this will be V minus NB. Um, and this is my uh, van der Waals equation. Okay. So um, the uh, and that's a two A's and one L. The van der Waals equation is for non-ideal gases. You have these correction factors to the pressure and to the temperature, uh, rather to the volume. Okay. Again, A and B are constants for a given substance that you will look up uh, from a table. Everything else is just the same. Moles, volume, pressure, just like always. Okay, so uh, this uh, is useful for what we call real gases because not all gases under all conditions will obey the... Um, the ideal gas law and so we have to use um, this corrected version which is based on experiment so we call it a semi-empirical equation um, whereas uh, this one is just uh, completely uh, theoretical